So that's like end game, right? Like that's pretty much end game. See, I thought a nuclear missile would like wipe out everything. So today we are going to check out a video on a new channel to me called the Modern Muscle Channel. And it is called, how would the United States fight a nuclear war? Isn't that a cheery subject for you today? Let's hope it never comes to that, but it might. I'm a lover, not a fighter. If you want to see more of me and my less fighty life, go check out patreon.com slash Diane Jennings for more behind the scenes stuff and early release music reactions. Let's do this. It's been over 80 years since a major conflict has broken out in Europe. The result has left many with a deep sense of uncertainty. Nearly 70% of Americans surveyed by the American Psychological Association fear that we are at the beginning stages of World War III. The prospect of nuclear conflict, once unthinkable, is now a very real possibility. Today we're going to explore the unthinkable. How would the United States respond during a nuclear conflict? What's America's nuclear war plan? How many nuclear weapons are readily available to the president? Where are they? What are their targets? How many missiles would be launched? How many casualties could we expect after American bombs reach their destinations? What would the world look like going forward? And most importantly, could the United States win a global nuclear war? Just going right out the gates. That looks like there's a lot more nuclear bombs than I thought there were. I thought there was like maybe five. I might be wrong. I thought like it was quite rare. I had hoped. I'm wrong, obviously. Nuclear triad. The United States operates under a nuclear triad consisting of land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs, sea-based submarines armed with submarine launch ballistic missiles or SLBMs, and air-based strategic bombers carrying gravity bombs and air-launched nuclear cruise missiles. Now let's take a look at each part of America's triad and its weapon delivery systems. The first and most well-known part of America's nuclear triad is its land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs. The U.S. has 400 LGM-30 Miniman-3 ICBMs that are launched via silos. These 400 missiles have a range of over 6,000 miles and have near pinpoint accuracy. When launched, the Three Strays Miniman-3 travels at speeds of over 15,000 miles per hour, reaching its target in under 30 minutes. Each Miniman-3 missile carries one warhead. 200 Miniman-3 missiles are armed with a 335 kiloton W87 Mark 21A warhead, while the other half are armed with a 300 kiloton W78 Mark 12 warhead. Each warhead has around 40 times the destructive power of the bombs dropped on Japan in 19. 45. Oh damn. Oh damn. America's Miniman 3 silos are based in three rural areas. The 90th Missile Wing at F.E. Warren Air Base in Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming. The it's 91st okay. Missile Wing at Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. And the 341st Missile Wing at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Each wing has three squadrons, and each squadron has 50 Miniman 3 silos. They're collectively controlled by five hardened underground control what? launch centers, each operated with two military officers around the clock at all times. In the event that launch command centers are destroyed in a surprise attack, or the military officers inhabiting the launch command control centers get cold feet, these missiles can and will be remotely launched from an airborne command center, carrying out orders from the president. As with all things, there are advantages and disadvantages of the silo-based Miniman 3. Its primary advantage is that these 400 missiles make the most responsive leg of the nuclear triad. America's land-based ICBM force has remained on continuous, around-the-clock, 24-7 alert since 1959. They can be quickly launched in less than five minutes. America's silo-based ICBMs offer a strategic advantage as well. Due to their remote launch capability, an effective nuclear attack against America's Minutemen 3 silos will require at least 400 warheads, or one bomb aimed at each silo, forcing the enemy to use and deplete a considerable amount of their nuclear arsenal. But this strategic advantage also highlights the Minutemen 3's disadvantages. America's land-based Minutemen 3s are inherently vulnerable, as their location is commonly known, and therefore silos can and will be easily targeted. As a result, in the event of a large-scale attack, the president would be put Jesus. in a sticky situation. He or she would have to either use Are these 400 missiles or lose them, forcing a large-scale retaliatory attack in response to perceived incoming warheads targeting American silos. With enemy missiles already in flight, the leader of the free world would only have 15 minutes to decide. And once a missile is launched, there is no turning back. Yeah. The second arm of America's nuclear triad is its air-based strategic bombers. 
The U.S. Air Force currently operates a fleet of 66 strategic bombers. America's strategic bombers are organized into nine bomb squadrons and five bomb wings at three bases. See, I thought a nuclear missile would like wipe out everything. Like, I know we had those ones that were set off back in the day and they wiped out whole cities, but I'd imagine they're even stronger now. So that seems like a lot. Like, why do we need so many? Also, there's a lot of numbers just going whoosh over my head. New Air Force Base in North Dakota, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, and Whitman Air Force Base in Missouri. There are 300 nuclear weapons currently deployed at strategic bomber bases in Why the do US. We need in addition to 100 tactical nuclear bombs are deployed at NATO air bases in Europe. Look, there's Ireland. America's bomber fleet consists of 46 B-52 Stratofortress bombers. Just to point out, we didn't have any nuclear weapons there. I don't think we have any, so if everyone could just leave us alone there, that'd be great. And 20 B-2 stealth bombers. The B-2 stealth bomber can carry up to 16 1,200 kiloton nuclear gravity bombs. Each gravity bomb contains a massive payload of 150 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. The B-52 Stratofortress bomber is 150 a times Hiroshima. So that's like endgame, right? Like, that's pretty much endgame? Why do you need so many? I'm confused. Range heavy bomber with the ability to travel up to 9,000 miles without refueling. The B-52 carries up to 20 AGM-86 subsonic air launch cruise missiles. When launched, the AGM-86 missile can travel over 1,500 miles at speeds exceeding 555 miles per hour, using its independent guidance system to deliver a W-80 150 kiloton warhead to its target in less than 90 seconds. Each warhead contains around 20 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The primary advantage of using air-based strategic bombers is that they can be called back if necessary. Furthermore, subsonic air-launched nuclear cruise missiles are a lot harder to defend against. When launched, an enemy force would have to counterattack each missile individually, making defense costly and complicated. The small size also makes them difficult to detect on radar. The primary disadvantage of strategic bombers is their response time. They take a lot longer to get in the air. And if air bases aren't on high alert, or if planes aren't already in flight, there's a high probability of them being destroyed in an initial surprise attack. This is particularly true for bomber bases located in Europe. Okay, Dublin's sitting pretty down there now at the moment. How are we doing in Spain? The last and most important part of America's nuclear triad are its nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. The U.S. Navy operates a fleet of 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. Each submarine oh, carries submarines. 20 Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The Trident II SLBM is the most destructive weapon in America's nuclear arsenal. Each missile is armed with either four or five 475 kiloton W-88 warheads. In theory, each sub can launch its entire 20-missile payload, virtually undetected in under seven minutes. When launched, the three-stage Trident II travels at speeds of over 18,000 miles per hour, has a range of over 7,500 miles, and typically reaches its target or targets in around 15 minutes. Each warhead is guided by a multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle, or MIRV, allowing a single Trident II missile to deliver up to five warheads to five separate targets. Okay, how precise is the science of them landing exactly where they're supposed to? I don't know anything about this stuff, but I have a funny feeling it's not exact but you tell me in comments. Just one Trident tube missile alone, armed with five warheads, has 154 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Overall, the U.S. has around 70% of all of its warheads on submarines, and with good reason.
There are numerous advantages of the ballistic missile submarine. For starters, they make up the most survivable leg of the nuclear triad. Ballistic missile submarines are virtually undetectable at sea. Their stealth design makes finding one an almost impossible task, giving pause to potential adversaries. With at least 10 submarines on constant patrol at all times, ballistic missile submarines assure that the U.S. can strike at any time, anywhere, even after a surprise attack. With each sub carrying an average of 100 warheads each, they have enough firepower to make just one submarine the sixth most powerful nuclear power in the world. In terms of disadvantages, there simply are none. None, none, zero. Death. <laughs> that's, a, that's a disadvantage. Part two. Major attack option one. When people imagine a nuclear war, the first thing that comes to mind is large cities like Los Angeles and Moscow being incinerated in a blaze of nuclear hellfire. While this would definitely be a likely outcome, the reality is that around 70% of the 1800 nuclear warheads currently deployed by the United States aren't aimed at large cities, but instead at an enemy country's nuclear forces. To better understand this, we first need to take a look at America's current strategic nuclear war plan, also known as the Single Integrated Operational Plan, or PSYOP. First drawn up in 1950, the PSYOP focused primarily on the Soviet Union. While today most of the weapons in the war plan still target Russia, other countries such as China, North Korea, India, and Pakistan are included as well. In this video, we'll take a look at a nuclear exchange with the only nuclear power comparable to the United States, the Russian Federation. This portion of America's nuclear war plan is called Major Attack Option 1. Major Attack Option 1 is the most demanding attack option available to the President. Should the Commander-in-Chief order Major Attack Option 1, the resulting attack would consist of over 1,000 war Heads, targeting Russian nuclear forces, including ICBM silos, road mobile ICBMs, submarine bases, primary airfields, nuclear storage facilities, design and production complexes, critical command and control facilities, and civilian population centers. Now let's take a look at a major attack option one, its Russian targets, the American nuclear weapons used, and the overall outcome of an American thermonuclear attack on Russia. So, to sum up, not good. Let's not do that. Shout out today to a couple of very special people. Our first shout out today comes from Ricky Carey. He wants to shout out all the lifeguards working this summer to keep everyone safe at the swimming pools and beaches during the summer. It's a really hard job to do in the hot weather. Thank you so much. Up next, we have Brian Ediger, who wants to shout out all those who transport others, such as pilots, bus drivers, taxi and rideshare drivers. He says, thank you for being willing to sit or drive or fly for hours on end and take people where they want and need to go. Thank you to each and every one of them. And thank you to you, Brian. Thank you so much, guys. Go hug your dog, because that was terrifying. No. No. Oh, you need a bath, stinky poo.